Okay, Math 1530 students, we are now going to learn how to make some other graphs for Chapter 2. Um, we have already learned to make histograms. Now we're going to learn to make some stem and leaf plots, dot plots, time series plots, a Pareto chart, and a pie chart. So, to begin, we will start with a problem about um, making a stem and leaf plot. And we have listed below here are the points scored per game by the Florida Gators during the 2006 football season. And we are going to use that data to create a stem and leaf plot to display the data. So to begin, what we want to do is to understand what a stem and leaf plot is. And basically, a stem and leaf plot is only good for data in a relatively small set, number one, and data that is very few digits, two or three digits. It doesn't matter about the decimals, but it doesn't ma does matter about the digits, and it matters that the range of the data isn't too great. So this is um, usually uh, a, what we call a field technique that is performed by statisticians who are gathering data on a daily basis and analyzing it as they go along. So this data lends itself actually very well to a stem and leaf plot. So let's get started. First thing we need is we need a vertical line, which is going to um, separate the stem from the leaves. And on the left side of the line is gonna be where the stem is. And the leaves are going to be on the right side. And the stem here is going to be the tens digit. And the unit digit or the ones digit will be the leaves. And the first thing that we need to do to be able to determine what this uh, t tens digits will need are is to find the minimum and the maximum data value. And we see here that the minimum data value appears to be 17, and the maximum data value appears to be 62. So that means we need our stem digits to go from 1 to 6. And then we will need our leaves digits to go on the other side. And we're not going to make what's called an ordered stem and leaf plot because what we would do for that is we would first rank order the data so that our leaves would be in numerical order. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take the data as it is. Now, if we take the data as it is, we're just going to go through the data and mark it out. So 34 is represented by going to the tens digit 3 and adding the leaf, which is 4. And this gives us the key for our stem and leaf plot. That way people know how to read our stem and leaf plot. So then we'll go through and finish off all the rest. We have a 21, a 28, a 17, 
a 25, a 62, a 38, a 42, 26, 23, 21, 17, 21, and 41. And one of the things that I would like for you to notice here is that we include the digit 5 for the tens digit, even though that digit has no leaves. It's important that it be that it be included there because that's how we actually can make sure we've maintained the distribution of the data. And since we've made a histogram before, I would like to point out to you that if you were to take the histogram, if you take this stem and leaf plot and you were able to rotate it by um, 90 degrees, what you would see happen is that you actually have a nice histogram here, and I'm going to demonstrate where that histogram is. So we'll start with outlining the bars, and here's our first bar, and here's our second bar. And here's our third bar. Here's our fourth bar. There is a missing bar for the five. And our last bar only has one digit in it. And so you can, basically the thing is, we can see that this set of data is skewed right even though we haven't actually constructed the histogram because most of the data appears in the very beginning part and the number of values trails off once you reach that peak. And another thing that we'll learn, this is just a little preview of coming attractions, is that the modal class here would be the class that would be the 20s. That's a word that's going to come to you in Chapter 3. Just a little preview. And then the last thing we want to be sure we do is we always include a title. And so the title... Give myself a little more room up here. My title will be Florida Gators. And I think I'm just going to abbreviate and put that Gators... points per game two thousand six and I hope you'll understand here that I'm doing this on an iPad and for those of you who have much better handwriting than I do on an iPad I truly salute you so that is our stem and leaf plot. So our next plot is going to be what's called a time series chart. And this one is about the University of Tennessee. UT has several dis different preseason rankings presented by the AP poll for the years 2002 to 2007. So what we have listed here are the preseason rankings for the Tennessee Volunteers and we're going to create what is called a time series chart. A time series chart simply shows how their rankings went um, over the course of the years as they passed. So when we do a time series chart, we have two axes.
and the horizontal axis always represents the time in years. And so we're going to have one for 2002, four, sorry, three. Left out my three. Four, five, six, and seven. And even though normally uh, we would start this at zero and go up, the rankings actually, the higher ranking is the ranking of one, and the lower ranking or the higher ranking is the ranking of one, and the lower rankings are the larger numbers. And so their ranking, their um, lowest ranking was in 2006 at 23. So we're going to let the bottom of this graph actually be at 25. And then we're going to go, this would be 20. This would be 15. This would be 10. This would be five. And our top ranking here would be the number ones. So actually, if we're count incrementing by five, that would be the zero rank, but we don't have a zero rank, of course. So in the year 2002, their rank was fifth. So we go 2002 and up to the five. And we make a point. And then in 2003, they were ranked 12th. And that would be between 10 and 15. So we'll say that's about here. And then in 2004, they were ranked 14th. So that would be just a little closer to 15. And then in 2005, they were ranked third. And then in 2006, very next year, they were ranked 23rd. And then in 2007, they were back, ranked back at 15. And what this gives us is a picture of what happened to UT's rankings over the year. So they started out in 2002 ranking not too bad, but then they dropped off in 2003. They dropped off again in 2004. Then they shot up to third in 2005 sank almost to the bottom in 2006, and then bounced back in 2007. And that gives us a picture of what their rankings were over time. Of course, these lines should have been straight. That's tough on an iPad. And actually, this is much easier if I do this on graph paper. So I would encourage you to do graphs like this if we do any more by hand to do those on graph paper. Most of our graphs, however, will be constructed in Excel. So now we have another type of plot, something called a dot plot. And it is kind of similar to the stem and leaf plot, except it's not usually done with a, a vertical axis. It's usually done on a horizontal axis. But similar to the um, stem and leaf plot, we're going to work with evenly spaced numbers along an x-axis, and we're going to have to list every single possible uh, value in the ages from the minimum to the maximum along that vertical axis. So the first thing we need to do in these ages, which is the ages of students in a section of Math 1530, we need to identify... Uh, the minimum and the maximum ages. 
So it looks like the minimum age for a college student in that classroom was, it appears to be 18. And the maximum seems to be 42. So we need something that we can put in dots that go from 18 to 42. So we're gonna create an axis, a horizontal axis, just a horizontal line. We're gonna to try to make it evenly spaced as best we can. So I'm gonna start this at 15 and 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. So 42 is all the way over at the edge. And every one of our ages then actually, and I'm going to erase my max and min now so that I can see everything clearly. All of these are going to be represented by dots. And so my first age is 18. And then I have one at 19. And then I have one at 20. And another 18. And a 35. And a 26. And an 18. And you can see what I'm doing is I'm just stacking up the dots kind of evenly spaced as I get repeats. And then I have a 21. And a 20. And a 24. And a 38. And an 18, and a 24, and another 21, and a 22, and an 18, and a 19 and a 42, and a 27, and a 19. And what this allows us to do much more easily than if we're, all we're doing is looking at that chart is it allows us to see the spread of our data and also to see the distribution of our data once again. So once again, I'm gonna talk about distribution. Notice the data has its tallest, its tallest group of dots is at the beginning at the 18 year old. It drops off fairly quickly. And so it is definitely skewed right. Now the good thing about this, the dot plot is that it allows you to actually recover the data because you can read each dot and know that you have one, two, three, four, five, 18 year olds. And 
and you see you have three 19 year olds. You see that you have two 20s and two 21s. Then you have a 22. And then you have two 24 year olds. And then you have one each of all the rest. So you have one 26 year old, one 27 year old, one 35 year old, one 38 year old, and one 42 year old. And so your ages would be X and your frequencies would be shown on the other columns. So you can recover your data and recover it into a, uh, a frequency distribution. So that's a good thing about a dot plot. And the same thing can be said about your stem and leaf plot. You can recover that also. So we will move on now. And we are going to make something called a Pareto chart. Now, a Pareto chart is a special type of bar chart. And a bar chart is like a histogram. The difference between a histogram and a bar chart is that a histogram's bars touch. <clears throat> Excuse me. A histogram's bars touch. Whereas a bar chart, the bars do not touch. Okay? There's a space or a gap between them. And that's because histograms are for quantitative data, whereas bar charts are for categorical data. And you see here that our data values are actually categories, the type of food. Now the difference in a Pareto chart and a bar chart before I actually make this one is that a Pareto chart has the categories ranked in order of decreasing frequency. So the tallest bar represents the most frequent category and they're put in descending order. But again, these are category data. So this is the Pareto. And this is the bar chart. So with all of that said, now we're ready to actually talk about constructing this.
So, our categories are hot dogs, hamburgers, cotton candies, funnel cake, kettle corn, and caramel apples. Now, if we put these in order, the first thing that we need to do is to realize which category is going to be the tallest. And the tallest category, and I'm just going to use some numbers to rank these. The tallest category is the hot dogs, then the hamburgers, and then the next category would be the funnel cake. And then the next category would be the caramel apple. And then our next category would be the cotton candy. Oops, wrong number. And then the last one is going to be the kettle corn. So, when we construct our Pareto chart, that needs to be the order that we make our bars. And normally we would use graph paper for this, but I didn't supply you with any, so we're just going to do our best to make this make some sense. So we are going to try to create a horizontal axis that's relatively even. And I'm going to abbreviate these categories as well. So let's see, this. if this is zero and this is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, I don't think I'm going to make it far enough. So let me back those up. And try to make it a little bit taller and my marks a little closer together. So let's see, this needs to be about 200. And this needs to be about 100. So this would be 150. This would be 50. So 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 100, 110, 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90, 200. And so our first category is going to be the hot dogs. And their bar is going to go up to 186. And that tells us that the hot dogs were the number one seller. Followed closely by the hamburgers, which sold 124. And I'm trying to keep my bars as close to the same width as possible. And then we sold 64 funnel cakes. And we sold 48 caramel apples. And we sold 38 cotton candies. And bringing up the rear is the kettle of corn with 34. Oops, it is kettle with a K.
And so here we have our Pareto chart, once again, with the bars in order, the tallest bar first. And it is common to add your frequencies to the top of the bar when you're making a bar chart or a Pareto chart. Just to make them easier to read. And again, we will also make these in Excel. And remember, we should always have a title. I've left that off on several of these. But this is the food. And this is the number sold. And this is um, fair food. Or if you wanted to make it more descriptive, you could say it is popular fair food because they probably had other food there as well, but these are the ones that sold best. And so that is a Pareto chart. And we have one chart left to make. And that is our pie chart. And I am actually going to tell you we're not going to make this pie chart by hand because pie charts made by hand are far more aggravating and difficult to make than any other chart. And so I'm going to teach you to make pie charts in Excel, and this will be our first one. Okay, and so that is going to conclude our lesson on other charts. Constructing them by hand is not the focus of what we're doing. We only constructed a few by hand so that you understand more how to read them than to construct them. So I will see you on cl in class next time. Be sure and get your Chapter 1 and Chapter 2 homework ready to turn in, and I will post answers for you so that you can check your work. See you next class.